Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar, Regulatory, Nutritional, and Analytical Challenges of Novel Animal Food Ingredients. This webinar will be hosted by Claire Kruger, President and Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at Chromadex Spirit Consulting, and Roger Clemens of the University of Southern California. I'm Genevieve Randall, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Carrie Conrad of Eurofin's Nutrition Analysis Center will also be joining as a panelist for the Q&A session at the end. Before we begin, I'll let you know more about how this webinar will run. The webinar is being recorded and the slides and recording will be available for you within three business days. A short Q&A session will follow the presentation to answer your viewer submitted questions. During the webinar, you can submit questions you have using the webinar sidebar menu. Select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit the enter key on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions throughout the webinar. Okay, Claire, you may begin your presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Well, good morning, everyone. and Thank you so much for being here this morning. We're gonna talk about food for animals, uh, farm animals, companion animals. And what I wanna focus on today are the differences in the regulatory paths for the things that we add into the food for our companion or, or farm animals. And we'll try to differentiate between those things that we um, notify as generally recognized as safe, those things that go down a food additive route, and those things that are then identified as drugs. Next slide, please. So why is it so important? Well, because all of the animals that we care for um, need food. And Farm animals, for example, some of them pictured here are more companion animals, for example, and very expensive companion animals such as horses. But others provide food that we eat, um, either become food or provide food, eggs, meat. And so what they eat not only affects their health, but it potentially impacts our health because they're a source of nutrition for us. Next slide. And of course, we all have our favorite companion animals and pets are a big part of our family. Um, th these are three of my little, little darlings and each of them actually has some very different nutritional and health needs that impact how I choose foods and how I look for ingredients in foods. So two cats, one very old, one a uh, you know, young active animal and my dog who has actually a congenital disease um, kidney dysplasia, which does not give a very good prognosis, but which can be managed to give him best quality of life through nutrition and different food interventions. And so, um, like me, many of you look for things in food products for animals that provide something more than just basic nutrition, but that can help the animals with potentially improving their quality of life. So next slide, please. The consumer focus has, as I said, gone beyond basic nutrition. And there are added health benefits that we look for, quality of life, longevity, sometimes symptom management. And it's a huge market. Uh, we spend a lot, not only on farm animals, but pet products itself is just an enormous market for companies. Next slide. And so to gain a competitive edge, we look for different things on the labels for our food for animals. Um, and, and the emphasis now on going beyond just basic nutrition into perhaps giving the animals better quality of life um, and helping them with different health impacts, uh, a lot of new or novel ingredients are being developed. Some of these reflect human trends in what we think is good for ourselves. Um, and Roger's gonna talk a lot of, in the next uh, presentation about why animals are not just small, adorable, fuzzy humans, and they have their own unique nutritional needs that impact how we really do need to think about safety and efficacy. Um, but companies do look for, how do we support claims? What is it doing? What should we say about it? Um, and how would the consumer, how would this impact consumer thinking about the food that they give to their, to their animals? And so the goal is to grow and to capture market share. But how we do that really impacts, yep, that, that's fine, great, next slide. You were correct. 
Um, she's trying to read my mind, doing a great job of it. So as, as we develop a product, we're, we're thinking about um, the whole life cycle of this product. And all of these different factors um, really feed off of each other and, and bleed in together to impact how we think about that new ingredient for the product. So what, what are we trying to put this new ingredient in for and how are we developing, formulating the food? Is it just nutrition or are we adding things that impact what we can say about what it may do for the health or the quality of life for the animal? And what we say and what we think we want to say has a tremendous impact on the regulations that are going to apply to that new ingredient. And we're gonna talk a lot about this in my session. Um, and then how do we define this? Oops, I'm sorry, go back. How do we define the specifications for that product pre-market? How do we know that ingredient is, is going to be safe? Because we have to think not only about what it's gonna do, but is it actually going to be safe? And as we said, you know, humans are not just giant rats and dogs are not just small humans. Um, and then what is the final product uh, testing specification so that we've assured consistency of that final product? So next slide. Let's just think about for a second, what, what actually is an animal food? Well, animal food is regulated by the government under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. And those regulations are published in the Code of Federal Regulations. And food is defined, not very, um, not, not very informative definition. Food is defined as food. We're supposed to know it when we see it, which we typically do. But very importantly, that food must be not adulterated or misbranded. And so we have to ensure that that food is packaged and held under sanitary conditions. Uh, we have to look at what could potentially contaminate it. It can't contain poisonous or deleterious substances. And it could be misbranded if the labeling is false or misleading or doesn't include required information. So the regulations for animal food are the same as those for human food. Next. Uh, you, can, you can fill out the entire slide. It's a build on slide. So who regulates animal food? And there are several, um, several different agencies that, that touch on animal food. The primary agency that regulates and has regulatory authority over animal food charged with enforcing the federal laws is the, federal, the Food and Drug Administration, and that division is um, CDM. So they ensure the Center for Veterinary Medicine that the food is safe and properly labeled, they ensure that the food additives that you add are safe and effective before approving it. They accept generally recognized as safe notifications. And they're also responsible for ensuring that animal drugs are safe and effective before approving it. And drugs uh, are not only have to be safe uh, and foods not only for the animal, but also for uh, farm animals, for the human that that will then use that animal for food. Now the, the Food and Drug Administration works in cooperation with an agency called the Association for American Feed Control Officials, AFCO, in developing state laws, defining ingredients, and establishing nutritional requirements. And so AFCO uh, does not have regulatory authority, but their members include those from the State Department of Agriculture and the FDA. And they write model bills, which may be accepted as state law. They establish these legal definitions of ingredients, labeling requirements, and nutritional requirements for pet food. And so FDA and AFCO work hand in hand to help us to define um, the ingredients that go into our animal foods. Now, in addition to FDA, which has the primary regulatory authority, and AFCO, which helps, helps us to establish the legal definition, USDA assists uh, the State Department, uh, that helps assist FDA in investigations in uh, protecting the animal food supply. And State Department of Agriculture is in charge with enforcing the state law. So they provide the inspections, and investigations based on any you know, veterinary complaints, and they do random testing. So all four of these 
work in juxtaposition to ensure the safety of the and the appropriateness of the animal food supply. And we're going to talk a lot more now about those specific regulatory paths. So if we go to the next slide. Let's focus on FDA. So FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, their mission statement is to protect human and animal health. And I want to stress that they're charged with not only protecting the animal health, but as I said before, if we feed a pig or a chicken or a cow food and we eat the meat or the eggs or the milk that come from those animals, we are responsible, they're responsible for making sure that it's safe for humans. So what goes into the animal can very well wind up as residue in the food that, that humans eat. And so they're responsible for approving the drugs and the food additives and monitoring the safety and the effectiveness of those products for the animals. Next slide. So the regulatory paths for an ingredient, something that's gonna go into the food as a food ingredient is one of three pathways. It's either approved as a food additive and a food additive, once a regulation for that specific substance is promulgated would be listed in the Code of Federal Regulations, 21 CFR Part 573. Now, if it qualifies for an exemption from the food additive regulations, an ingredient that is added to animal food can be determined to be safe and appropriate and legal for use using this generally recognized as safe pathway. And that there's a partial list of generally recognized as safe substances that's listed in the Code of Federal Regulations. There is also, since the regulatory uh, uh, regulations have changed, uh, FDA is no longer responsible for approving petitions for generally recognized as safe ingredients. And now all grass substances are uh, either determined to be safe, self-determination by qualified experts, and or once that is done, voluntarily, voluntarily notified to FDA under the CDM GRASS program. And so you can see there the link for substances which now that it has changed since 1997, anything that's GRASS and added to animal food and voluntarily notified would be listed in that link of the inventory for GRASS substances for animal food. Now something that is intended to add color has to go down a separate pathway and that's at a color additive which is approved pre-market by the FDA. And we're not gonna talk further about color additives, but let's dive into the differences between food additives and grass. So next. Um, the, the, other, the other pathway, and this, this is something that I think um, most of you are probably very familiar with, particularly if you own pets, because you walk into any pet store, you walk into your veterinarian's office, and you're going to see uh, a plethora of dietary supplements intended for, for your pets um, and, and or even things like horses and other, other animals. Dietary supplements are a regulatory class that was established by Deshay back in 1994. And in the 1996 Federal Register Notice, and this is something that most people don't recognize, um, it was established that dietary supplements actually do not apply to animal food. They're actually not legal for use in animals. And so FDA, if you go to FDA with something that's intended to supplement um, the pet's diet or the animal's diet, the supplements are typically considered by FDA as animal drugs. And that is because under the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, an express or implied claim that establishes an intent to cure, treat, prevent, or mitigate disease, or, and this is very important, affect the structure or function of the body in a manner other than nutrition, taste, or aroma, is classified by the Food and Drug Administration as a new animal drug and must go down approval via the new animal drug application pathway. So for example, something like a probiotic, 
for gastrointestinal health is classified by the FDA as a drug for animals, whereas a microorganism that provides a nutritional benefit, for example, it is fermented in the gut to provide a source of butyrate, a short chain fatty acid, um, that could be determined to be grass or food additive. Now, you're probably asking yourself, wow, this sounds a lot different than human because we have a lot of dietary supplements. FDA recognizes them as supplements, recognizes probiotics as supplement and not drug. Um, how does this occur? And we're going to talk about that. Uh, it's a very unique pathway that, that's kind of an exemption to, to this rule. But very important to note that actually, by, by law, dietary supplements are prohibited for use in animals. Next slide. So food additives are uh, listed, the, the procedure by which one gets pre-market approval for a food additive in an animal food is described in the Code of Federal Regulations. And the key thing to remember here is that food additives are things that must, uh, must receive FDA approval prior to the marketing. So a petition is prepared, sent to the Center for Veterinary Medicine, CVM of the FDA, and they evaluate it, determine that it's safe for use as, um, as described, they promulgate a regulation, which you then find in the Code of Federal Regulations. Until that regulation is promulgated, that food additive cannot be used in the animal food. What's also very critical to deciding what path to go down is that a food additive, once it is published in regulation, is generic. And so any company meeting the definition of that ingredient that's approved as a food additive can then market that food additive because it applies to everyone who meets that definition. Next slide. Grass is a very important and a critical exemption to the food additive approval process for both humans and animals. And most companies prefer to use the grass pathway because this does not require a pre-market approval by the FDA before it can be added to foods. And that applies to both human and animal. It's an exemption to the legal definition. And in effect, it establishes that there is sufficient public availability of information and consensus of opinion amongst, among experts who are qualified by their training and experience that this substance is, is safe for use in the uh, appropriately in, in the, uh, the use for which it's intended. So something that's determined to be grass does not have to be pre-market approved by the FDA. And very importantly, the notification to FDA of the grass status is voluntary. So everything you see in the inventory, uh, it's, it was, it's grass, it's simply notification. And whether or not FDA agrees that you've provided a sufficient argument for the basis, they themselves do not make the determination that it's safe and legal in food. Next slide, please. So the general recognition of safety is for the intended use. And very importantly here, it applies to the particular use and so this safety determination must address the intended use in the intended animal species. So something that's determined to be safe for use in a cat does not necessarily mean it's safe to use in a pig. And Roger's gonna talk a lot about why that is and the differences among animals that, that impact our understanding of safety and efficacy in different animal species. So we do need to make sure that we are addressing the safety in the target animal. Next slide, please. So establishing the safety uh, is the same standard of scientific rigor as for food additive. This is not a shortcut to legal approval. The standard is reasonable certainty of no harm, and we must consider all of these factors. So we have to define the substance very well, chemistry, manufacturing and controls, how it's going to be used, the level at what's going to be used, the intake that will result, 
how do we establish the intended effect, the nutritional effect or the technical effect? What is the safety data in the target species considering the safety information that we have? And for food producing animal species, what is the possibility of residue because those animals or their products are then going to be consumed by humans? So we have a kind of a two-step process there to be considered to show that we generally recognize that this is going to be safe and reasonably certain to cause no harm in both the animal and or the human. Next slide. So experts may draw their conclusion based on, uh, by law, common use in animal food prior to 1958, virtually impossible to do at this point, or what's now used, scientific procedures, which again, establishes safety based on the same scientific rigor required for food additive, but has these two important elements. There must be a consensus of the scientific opinion, and it must be based on pivotal evidence that's generally available. And by that, I mean published. So grass status, status is actually more difficult to establish than a food additive regulation due to the requirement for the general recognition. So one must establish in the public domain that experts agree. Um, however, one of the benefits of going the grass route is that this grass determination is specific to that product. So it has the propri a proprietary nature that is not found in a promulgated food additive regulation. And so that is another benefit to the grass, grass pathway. So let's talk about now where people can, uh, companies trip up, and that is animal drug. And so something that is going to be marketed or that's intended by a company to be used to diagnose, cure, mitigate, treat, or prevent a disease or to affect the structure or function of the body is going to be regarded by FDA as a drug. So, um, you know, a company sells bottled water for people to drink as a beverage. It's not a drug. But if you put on your label that this bottle of water is a cure for cancer, then the water is a drug. Not because you changed it, not because it wasn't water, but because you said that it was going to cure a disease. Uh, if a company sells a product that claims that it makes cows ovulate at the same time, the product is a drug. So it's not treating even necessarily treating or preventing a disease, but it, in this case, it's changing how the body functions. So as I said before, in one of my previous examples, a probiotic designed to be bifidogenic and to, uh, to, to mitigate uh, infection by pathogens or reduce their, their level, that's a drug according to FDA's definition. If we are simply saying we're providing a microorganism that confers a nutrient, that's not a drug. And so we have to be very, very careful because the structure function part of it can trip a company up into what well, they want to position this as a food ingredient and they have now actually moved off into animal drug, which one does not want to do unless one really wants to do that because it's a long, expensive, egregious, difficult process. Next slide. So uh, as I mentioned before, AFCO works with FDA. This is the Association of American Feed Control Officials. And their function is to provide a mechanism for developing, implementing these definitions for food products. Uh, FDA recognizes AFCO as a standard setting body. Next slide. Their definitions are published in the AFCO official publication. They have a comprehensive list of substances accepted for the US and by for use in food. FDA recognizes uh, the feed ingredient definitions and uh, the uses for substances are intended to be used in the target animals, human food, and the environment. Um, the AFCO, um, uh, when, when one submits a definition for a feed ingredient to AFCO, uh, the, definition, the definition request, the, the safety information uh, it, that's sent to CVM is, uh, uh, they would, uh, to, to AFCO would be sent to CVM. So AFCO does not do any scientific evaluation of safety, but they provide the concurrence for the definition. So CVM would work with AFCO there 
to evaluate and confirm safety. Next slide. So we talked a little about the beginning. I, this was my cliffhanger. Um, how are there so many dietary supplements out there if it's actually illegal? Uh, so the National Animal Supplement Council uh, is, a, is not a regulatory authority, but engages regulatory agencies for consistent transparent policies. And companies may apply to earn the NASC quality seal. They must follow standards for good manufacturing practice, uh, participate in a reporting system, follow labeling and claims guidelines, and pass audits. And products, um, of course, that would fall under Deshaies and that would be supplements for humans are actually not legal uh, in, in terms of being a supplement for animal use. However, and here's the fine print, FDA does not enforce all the laws that they are required to enforce with pet food and animal feed. And although the FDA policy, through FDA policy, the agency is allowed to, has allowed pet food to violate some of these federal laws. The State Department of Agriculture also does not enforce all the laws that they are required to enforce. And they follow FDA's lead in the lack of enforcement of some pet food laws. And so by virtue of this, this uh, fine print, uh, FDA has allowed uh, pet food or uh, pet uh, animal supplements to be on the market. And last slide, I think. So key takeaways here, um, any article intended for use in animal feed ingredient is considered a food subject to the FFDCA. The CDM is the regulatory authority charged with enforcing federal laws. FDA recognizes food additives and grass substances for animals. Uh, Deshay has a lot not allowed that um, Dietary supplements are allowed. However, because policy allows the agency to violate some laws, uh, dietary supplements for pets uh, and animals are allowed to exist. However, one must not intend it for use to cure, treat, prevent, mitigate disease, or affect the structure function of the body in a way that's other than as a food. Otherwise, it would be evaluated as a new animal drug. And I think that's that's it. All right, thank you, Claire. And next will be Roger with his presentation. I want to remind everyone that's watching today that they can continue to submit uh, questions that they have throughout the presentation and our speakers will uh, answer them at the end of the webinar. Thank you. Okay, Roger, you may start. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Thank you for participating in this really important this webinar. Thank you, Claire, for the extraordinarily clear and concise presentation on the regulatory framework of these things that called for our friends, four-legged friends, called companion animals and feed animals. Next slide, please. Well, as you can see in the upper right-hand corner are some of my four-legged friends. Uh, these are all rescue dogs. Uh, we only have rescue dogs. We really reach out to meet their needs, and, and all of our families, and all my girls, and and our grandchildren have all, only rescue dogs. But as we look at pet foods and we look at our rescue families, in fact, do we as humans know what their needs are? There are so many different breeds. Uh, we humans, typically consumers in general. Uh, don't know what we need uh, for nutrient, and so how do we know what the animals need for their nutrition, uh, for their basic nutrition? And then as we look at the transition uh, to Claire's excellent remarks, uh, that's healthy eating, whatever that means, that really translates from humans to dogs and cats, uh, which have their own style and needs, of course, and then it's the dietary guidelines of various regulatory bodies and scientific agencies and trade associations promote the consumption of fruits and vegetables for humans, but should they actually be consumed by our friends, uh, like our pet dogs here that you see in the upper right hand corner? And then as we transition to what they eat, do we, what about the label? Uh, does it say everything we want to eat? And, we will not show you an example of that, but the labeling for pet foods, and this is really Claire's domain, is markedly different uh, from that of human foods. And in particular of interest is that 
the term processing aids are not required by law to be declared uh, on human foods, but is required to be declared on pet food labels and food labels uh, for food uh, directed or intended for animal feed. So as Claire mentioned, uh, supplements. Does your dog really need supplements? And I'll leak that to you to decide, but Claire did an excellent job in showing the effect. Uh, technically, that's illegal, but clearly it's a four billion dollar business and going strong. Then you have to ask yourself, what is the science behind those kinds of products, which we may touch base a little bit later. And then as you have your own style of dietary patterns, uh, is your dietary pattern appropriate for your, in this case, your dog, your cat, or your fish, or your turtle, and the list goes on. And then what are healthy choices that we have to consider that? And many people consider healthy choices for me at, at, at table scraps may be healthy choices for my pet. And clearly that is not the case. And you can see the last I am there. And the bottom one is that importantly is I'll touch base with a few moments. What is safe for humans may not in fact be safe for pets. And importantly, uh, we of course, as we love our four legged friends, we want to be certain whatever we're giving our pets, those are our family members. We want to be certain that they are safe and healthful. Next slide. Well, these are some consumer expectations. You see the some statistics here, which may be of interest to you. Uh, Claire mentioned that gluten-free, clean labels, whatever that is. Uh, gluten-free is regulated in terms of human foods, but not regulated in foods and for pets. Uh, clean labels are not regulated at all. It's a matter of consumer perception. Um, and you see that consumers are asking for the same type of labeling, if you will, no, the no labeling in case of artificial flavors. We don't have actually artificial flavors and colors and preservatives. We actually in the United States don't have artificial colors. They're exempt colors. Uh, so it's um, how do you maintain uh, the or preserve the food for your pet food. Many people buy a 25, 30 pound bag of pet food. I know we do, and it's expected to last a month for our animals and our family friends. And, but why is it that it's that it's stable? We have to understand that. And obviously, throughout the storage period, wherever you store your food, we want to make certain that it remains safe. And you see all these other attributes. It's also interesting as you read the right hand column uh, that consumers will accept most of the processing necessary to provide uh, safety or good products for their pets. Uh, but if you try to apply the same product, the same thermal process or non-thermal process for human foods, uh, many consumers have, oh my gosh, moments and refuse to consume it. So bottom line, we, we really need to not only meet consumer expectations, but more importantly, we need to be certain that the food will provide for our four-legged family members that in fact is safe and helpful for them in their different diet. Next slide, please. Clearly, there is a tremendous movement, uh, as Claire mentioned, of humanization as a driving trend. So we see a lot of labeling going that direction. This gives you some statistics for that. Uh, and and when the challenge that we really have here is educating the general consumer. Uh, they don't understand labels for human foods, how do they understand labels for pet foods? And and that's really a major issue. So however you want to define that, well, clearly we have an educational opportunity as well. Uh, while we as humans may consider tasting food is really important to us, well, I can assure you that uh, how do you as a human know that it tastes good? Well, animals typically will re revolt. Uh, and not eat a product if it doesn't have that palatability factor here. And actually, the industry uses a lot of factors that help the food intake. But you see a lot of attributes here. The organic issue, of course, remains viable here in human foods. And clearly, if you look at labeling, as we will in a few moments, organic diets for pet foods are seen to be also by a third of the population want something organic. Uh, but remember, organic is not about quality. Organic is about process, as I defined by the National Organic Program. And you can see a lot of the other issues associated with the driving trends for humanization of pet foods as well. Next slide, please. Uh, um, because I teach toxicology at USC, I thought it'd be important for you to begin, the audience here, to begin to understand some of the complexities. Uh, avocado, I indicate here, uh, avocado was, we all maybe enjoy uh, guacamole, 
but be careful because the seed and the skin of that can, of avocados, uh, mostly from Mexico and from South uh, Southern California, uh, actually contain a, a toxin, a natural occurring toxin called persin. And dogs will not do well when they consume that. So we have to be careful with that sort of situation. Onions, so they, we many of us like anything from the Allison or elephant family or the Allium family. Uh, clearly, in this case, uh, onions, garlic, and similar type of products uh, actually contain Allison. It's a sulfur containing compound. And when animals consume this, they you see you have some impact on the red blood cells. And interesting also uh, that uh, onions, uh, actually when consumed by cats, uh, may lead to kidney disease, if not kidney failure. I can tell you that uh, one of my daughters uh, left one of our uh, onion plants out. Uh, the cat ate the onion um, scallions, and the cat subsequently passed away because of renal failure. So it's very serious. Obviously, many people understand that Chocolate that many people come to enjoy uh, contains a lot more compounds called methylxanthines, in this case theobromine, uh, which in fact is toxic to dogs. That seems to be well knowledge, but you see you can't feed chocolate to dogs or cats. Uh, xylitol, which is found in fruits and vegetables, is actually not good for dogs and cats. It leads to a liver disease. And obviously, many people think, well, when nuts are healthy, well, they are healthy, they reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease in humans. But in fact, uh, you see some of the issues in terms of macadamia nuts in this particular case and the issue associated with feeding nuts uh, to dogs. And uh, many people have uh, uh, believed that uh, eating uh, grapes might be beneficial for you, and certainly grape skins uh, may be beneficial because of a number of potential antioxidants. But we also remember that in this particular case, when fed to our our four-legged family members and that in fact could lead to kidney disease. So we really need to understand this continuum of tra the transition of humanization and what are the ramifications uh, when we take food that we consume considered healthy and feed it to our four-legged family members. Next slide, please. These are some fun slides uh, that I've taken out of the, the vintage part here. Uh, you can see here in a flash, you, that some members of this, there we go, uh, some classic members of some of the 40s and 50s. Some of you might have been around then. I, I know I was, and I reminisce about some of these early slides. But the point is that even then, uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, um, they're promoting healthful, uh, if you will, diets uh, for four-legged friends. Uh, yum, yum, yum. I remember Friskies and Dr. Pepper, Dr. Yes, Dr. Ross. Well, let's say we transition to a more contemporary environment with the next slide. You'll see that here we're really advertising the consistency, what humans are expecting. Um, humans think, well, for my pet should be grain free because dogs may not need the grain, but in reality, we look at their microbiome, make it to be quite beneficial. If you look at, in fact, <clears throat> the, the composition of mammalian milks uh, that affect a number of compounds called illegal saccharides that are generated through grains and sprouting the grains and it could be quite beneficial for the dogs and cats but yet uh, many products out there say they're grain free <clears throat> and you see some other here uh, in front of you uh, they're natural so I'm not sure what natural means actually AFCO has a definition of natural which I think would be interesting to see uh, and to hear about your comments about because natural is well defined under the AFCO definition under CVM, Center for Veterinary Medicine, and yet the FDA has yet to fully finally define what natural means uh, in terms of human foods. Next slide, please. Have a vegan dog, yes sirree. Well, you should know that the National Research Council, uh, this is published a number of years ago, remains, this is consistent that in fact, every food, not dietary supplement, but every food that which is marketed across the United States, and remember each state now approves um, the food that's gonna be marketed in that particular state. And it's not a central approval process um, under CVM or FDA, but every 
product under regulation within the state improves the food to be acceptable for interstate sales and, and commerce. And not to belittle uh, everything, you see very carefully that every food that's on there, dog marketed as such, in this case dog food, must meet these standards. Uh, so depending on age and stage of life, you out here the kind of amino acid profile for the crude protein. Crude protein is, de is actually declared on the label for the product. Crude fat is declared on the label. Again, you look at the uh, these down here in the left-hand corner, the fatty acid profile, and you see that, in fact, you need to meet these kinds of needs. Next slide, please. And similarly, in the next slide. Similarly, there's a, a, a requirement for various minerals that are listed as such, also known as ash, and labeling purposes. And here you have a list of various minerals that are required for growth and for maintenance in adult uh, dogs for uh, our particular case. And it's interesting too, well, these are actually required minimums uh, for the per 100 calories, 1,000 calories rather. It's interesting if you look at human diets, many of the nutrients that you see here are in fact not met from a human perspective, uh, but they are must be met uh, from meeting the needs of two of our four-legged family members. Next slide, please. This is all true for vitamins, and we'll touch base on vitamins uh, in a few moments, and what the impact of processing will have on the vitamin stability. Next slide, please. This is a graphic, this is a screenshot. Um, this is readily available if you want the full video clip, I can give that to you. The point here is that mom and daughter are out there shopping for pet foods, and it shows the care that the parents and children are actually taking to identify what they want for their pets. The four-legged animal uh, family member uh, would want to have. So grain-free, all the attributes you saw in the previous slide in terms of labeling, they're looking for the same attributes as they would like for their particular products. In fact, this clip shows that dogs of different breeds are actually out there shopping with them. It's quite interesting. Next slide, please. Well, what do people are what do people understand? Uh, this clearly indicates that the same type of notions that we see in human foods, the people and consumers in general are saying the same thing when it comes to food ingredients uh, relative uh, to pet foods. And obviously, the GMO is still an issue. Clearly, the American public doesn't understand what GMO is about. I find it interesting because I teach food and drug law and toxicology. Uh, that fact uh, we have GMO uh, medications, but no one cares about that. But obviously, GMO foods, but they care about that. Uh, they think that we should have digestive enzymes, natural digestive enzymes, it's suggesting that dogs and cats don't have an adequate amount of digestive enzymes, which of course is not true. Organic remains quite high. They think oh, organic is quite a measure of quality, and it's not. And it's scientifically formulated, well, my gosh, scientifically formulated as indicated on the right-hand side. That sounds artificial. I'm not sure that really gives me any credibility. So clearly, commuting, uh, communicating with consumers based on what you have and don't have is really critical to the product viability. Next slide, please. A part of the, that continued distrust is shown by this particular graphic. And you can see here up the left-hand corner, uh, that the majority of people are still looking for organic foods, but not so certain what scientifically formulated really means. And it's that, as indicated in the lower right-hand corner, it sounds unnatural. So how do you convey that you're trying to follow the National Research Council guidelines, provide the very best nutrition for the various breeds out there? Uh, how do we convey that? And it shows that there's a tremendous challenge to communicate that as we encourage people to find provide the best food for that particular breed and for like a family member. Next slide please. Well clearly that there's a effort uh, to look at uh, the best possible food 
for our four-legged family members. And this gives you, this graphic from the Nielsen ratings, it gives you a, a sense of what that is and what that isn't. And you can see there on the left-hand side of the various issues. But they, they believe that diet is important and we actually believe, and like consumers believe for human foods, uh, that diet has an impact on overall health. Um, but they often will feed what's thought good for them. Um, but to see, they believe too, like many people contend that in fact, be careful that I think food, pet food makes their oh, pet food, pets obese. But the reality is the practices or lifestyle will contend to do that. And uh, know who's training whom to eat. Uh, is the dog or cat training you to feed them or are you feed eating them because it's time? So uh, who's training who is I find it rather interesting. I know one of my dogs, actually has me well trained and when to feed her. So it's always an interesting dynamic here. Next slide, please. What about non-traditional foods uh, and showing up? And this gives you a perspective on uh, human foods and pet food owners. And you see here, uh, they're almost parallel. Um, you see the fruits and vegetables. Yeah, I think that's the French owners and like the US think we should have fruits and vegetables. Uh, chewies for our pet foods, uh, that we need to add certain nutrients to our pet foods uh, to make them more nutritious. The U.S. think it's more of an issue than the French. Uh, we should feed, the U.S. thinks we should feed them soups and stews, whereas the French don't think so. We think that we should have, consume uh, vitamin-rich waters. Uh, that's really not necessary, but you see a third of the population think it's important to do. Um, and various attributes you want to give to here. And energy and boosting snacks are quite popular uh, in America as well as in France. And well, I'm not your dog, your cat, but my dog is very, our dogs are very, very, very active. They don't need any more energy boosting snacks. And protein bars are by a quarter of the population, are very popular amongst the U.S. And you see here that, again, it's popular, somewhat popular there. And even protein bars. Protein, uh, we can argue that even amongst dogs and cats could be too much, although protein is the major opportunity for the cat world. And it's part of the opportunity, obviously, within dogs as well. And we should all feed our dogs and cats some type of smoothie, but at least there is some sense of reasoning that only about a, a fifth of the population think that has any viability. But it's interesting, the dynamics of understanding uh, of one's interest in non-traditional foods and what then becomes available to the, to the general public. Next. Well, there are actually two major areas uh, that we can actually make some uh, claims on this particular case. And the areas here in terms of dental health is actually a protocol uh, to show dental health and these called accepted claims. Uh, their uh, uh, VOHC uh, provides those criteria, and you actually petition uh, your data, submit your data to VOHC uh, for review. So when you're doing clinical work uh, that meet those criteria, they're reviewed by the agency, and you can make a claim, as you can see here on the left-hand side, uh, these types of oral care trees, and you see a lot of those out there. Those studies are not easy to do. I've done many of those. Uh, so uh, other than taking money, but it's a tremendous amount of work in terms of looking at the plaque and tartar that might build up during a particular uh, study design and, um, and various animals. And it's not always a pleasant feature to go through. But at the end of the day, what is considered under review, of course, through the IRB Institute Review Board, and meeting all the standards, in fact, of safety and efficacy, you see here that, in fact, you can ex have accepted claims as indicated there in the third column by tartar plaque, uh, which may be beneficial, of course. Next slide, plus. And these are some examples of the of the chews that, of that, in fact, are available that have met those kinds of standards. Next slide, please. The other part that's acceptable is relative to coat health. A lot of people say I, that I can tell the healthiness of your dog or your cat uh, by the coat. While there's not an, a particular protocol for this, uh, but uh, AFCO and CBM will accept a variety of skin and coat health uh, protocols and data here, and it gives you a good idea here what's here at all. We must also remind, remember that 
when it comes to dogs and cats that you can't you shouldn't use any shampoo that's appropriate for humans but actually more appropriate for our dogs so when our dog gets groomed uh, once a month uh, we certain that is good taking good care and interesting too that in fact for dogs health uh, we need to understand that omega-6 are important. Uh, while there's a push for human foods to have less omega-6, which we make naturally, that in fact dogs need that to maintain good coat. And obviously we see that omega-3s and their metabolism of these, omega these fatty acids are a little bit different. They're much more efficient than we find in humans. So um, we have to appreciate those differences, not only between among breeds, but appreciate the differences again between humans and our four-legged family members. Next slide, please. We have a lot of claims on human grade uh, per the FDA standard, but this is not regulated by the USDA as indicated. And as you see here, this was emphasized by, by Claire just moments ago. And you see just a few years ago that in fact would not do any pre-market review of human grade claimed pet foods. We, we sense that if you look at the safety, you look at for the intended population, in this case our intended, po intended population are dogs and cats for the most part, and obviously some other, other animals out there, food animals, but in fact they're not reviewing those. So pre-market approval is no longer required. And then you see here a specification route line and to Claire's excellent comment, <clears throat> there's an actually a definition uh, in the Code of Federal Regulations, but importantly, to reemphasize the comment a little bit earlier, that not all states will accept this definition advanced by AFCO. Remember, every state must approve a food to be marketed in that particular territory. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a bit of a challenge when you make these kinds of positions, and that so that the claim is, is actually remain truthful and not misleading. Next slide, please. These are some additional uh, claims that are out there. Um, these are anticipated claims because this represents part of the future of various products. And of course, we did a tremendous amount of effort in the human side to look at uh, the immune function, how different uh, ingredients and dietary patterns will actually strengthen one's immune system. So we see that's coming down the line. And this gives you one example here of, uh, for, as you can indicate by this particular graphic. Next slide, please. Additional anticipated claims, of course, allergies. Allergies uh, are a big issue in this country. They're certainly an issue in Canada, and they're actually very big issues across the, across the world when it comes to humans. But it's important to note that, in fact, different breeds have different sensitivities uh, relative to the food and food con components. And this gives you a, an overview of some of the differences amongst the, these kinds of breeds. So how do we test for these? And the same type of evaluation we do for humans, it's also can be done for, for our four-legged friends. And this in the classic symptoms or presentations, if you will, the itchiness, I mean, you as humans expect that. The you as humans get scabby red skin. So all the things that you see here, although we don't have tails, but the point is uh, there are some sensitivities. And so we need to listen uh, to our family member and so that, in fact, we can address these issues. But remember, the important message with this is that every breed is different. So what works for one breed may not work for another when it comes to uh, looking at various potential allergens in the food supply. Next, please. Another big area uh, comes to, in a human side, is digestive health. Uh, Dr. Kruger made a comment on the microbiome, remember so briefly. And so now we have a variety of foods that are out there uh, touting uh, that might be beneficial for the gut health. This gives you a couple of those examples, but also there's some challenges, not only in terms of safety, but what is beneficial. And again, you only get these types of ingredients from plants. And many people say, well, maybe we should transition from, from um, animal foods to plant foods for these animals. But in fact, animals, as it grew up through years, actually dominate in terms of the animal-based foods. Next slide, please. A couple more slides here. Uh, as, we, as we look at, as you know, when it comes to formulation of these kinds of products, we realize that, in fact, uh, low-fat diets are not good for animals. And then we found that more recently in the dietary guidance of 2015. Uh, in fact, uh, plant the low-fat diets are may not be good for humans. 
Uh, homemade, homemade diet is what we think it's important and fun to do. In fact, creates nutrient imbalances. And this gives you a laundry list of issues. We realize too, I just returned from an NIH meeting and showing that different mineral sources, uh, even for humans, have poor digestibility and poor uptake. We have to be very careful. So the pet food industry is very sensitive to being that to be providing nutrients that are really have good digestibility. Iron in this case is interesting. The iron for humans is considered to be about 10%. And here when it comes to iron for animals, it's 20% 20, 20 digestibility. So we have to be very careful in understanding that issue. And obviously at the bottom one there is that as most of the foods from pet foods actually goes through a thermal process called extrusion. And we have a slide on that. In this case, uh, uh, thiamine, which is known as vitamin B1, is particularly sensitive to heat processing. Next slide. Well, we're moving from, from kitchen to cocktails, as you indicated here. Uh, we need to understand the constant change in, in the nutrient requirements of our pet foods, and then, in fact, uh, we need to understand that they, all the foods were actually intended to be healthy, to help to meet all the nutrient needs for that particular breed. Uh, obviously, uh, in this case, there's no need for supplementation, but obviously humans take supplements, over two thirds of the humans take supplements, so they say, well, we should take it for our, our animals as well. Next slide. And so we're moving from, um, from uh, kitchen to canine as I pushed here. Uh, we have to really understand these kinds of form, uh, issues. And this occurred to see my friend, Alan Anderson, uh, who formulates uh, humanized foods. Uh, They're based in Florida. And we have to consider all these variables in terms of preparation and storage. And if you travel with your animals, many of our, my girls will travel with their, uh, with their pets. And so we not, they prefer not to leave them in a kennel care, but they actually preserve that they have the right food. Just be certain that, in fact, you feed them well and so they remain healthy. Next slide and for key takeaway messages. Here's some takeaway messages here. Bottom line is, just because food is safe for humans, they're not necessarily safe for animals. Uh, so we have to be careful. And this says are necessarily safe, but I should say are not necessarily safe for humans, uh, for animals. Uh, and we need to understand that nutrient requirements amongst breeds and species are vary, and we actually, importantly, that as we humanize the pet food industry and foods directed for our four-legged friends, in fact, meeting the nutritional needs is paramount, and that the humanization of those foods may not, in fact, meet their nutritional needs. With that, I thank you very much. All right, thank you. And now we will move into our Q&A session. Remember that you can continue to submit questions throughout the question and answer session, and our speakers will get back to you um, either during the session or after the webinar later this week. And we don't have any questions yet. All right, Claire and Roger, I guess you did a really thorough job. Um, so that wraps up our webinar. I want to remind everyone that's still on that a recording of the webinar along with a copy of the slides will be available within three business days. That will come to you via email. And thank you, Roger, for sharing your expertise and your presentation. You're welcome. It's been our pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.